Hello and welcome to our Game Changers live keynote with Mark Enzer. I'll just give Mark a quick introduction before we dive into his presentation. Mark Enzer is Mark McDonald's Chief Technical Officer and is head of the National Digital Twin Programme. Mark, I'll not embarrass you any further with any, any more introduction, but we're really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Um, so if you could share your screen and, and take us into your presentation, that'd be great. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A box um, and we'll pick them up following Mark's presentation. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's really good to, to be here and to actually have a little bit more time to, uh, to run through this, uh, this stuff to do with the National Digital Twin. Because very often what I find is that uh, I've got 15 minutes and I try to get in as many words as I possibly can in the 15 minutes. So it's really good to have a little bit longer now to take it a bit slower <clears throat> and dig into it in a bit more detail. And what I'm, I'm really hoping is that uh, it can turn into a bit of a conversation. Uh, I'm really looking forward to having that conversation with, uh, with Oliver, but also more broadly, because I'm imagining that uh, some of the stuff I'll say uh, will spur some, some questions and it will be just great to, uh, to discuss them. Uh, so, National Digital Twin as a game changer. Um, I'm convinced it is. Uh, and I'd like to uh, try and convince you too. So the way that I thought I'd do it um, is first by considering what is the game and, and what is the prize. Uh, then kind of dig into how we go about changing the game. Uh, and then uh, at the end, I thought I'd give you a, a bit of an update as to what we're actually doing about it and, and how that's going. Um, but um, items one and two are kind of the theory, the context bit of it. So, so do bear with that because we will get into what we're actually doing. So what is the game? What are we actually about? I think the game that we're talking about changing here uh, is to do with the broader built environment uh, and applying industry 4.0 thinking to our infrastructure and built environment. Um, and that is an absolute game changer. You know, our Victorian forebears did some amazing work for us uh, in the second industrial revolution, kind of kicking off the infrastructure that we, we know and love. Um, but that is largely physical. Uh, and I think that what we're doing uh, just now uh, is almost a rerun of that, uh, but doing it in the digital world. It's almost like we're building new digital worlds that mirror our physical world, that benefit our physical world and benefit the people in it. And, and I think that's probably, a, um, a, well, for me anyway, that the top point of what this is all about, uh, it's all about improving outcomes for, for people and society. That, that's what gives it purpose. That's what it's all about. Uh, but it's using some pretty clever stuff in the digital world to derive those benefits for people and society. So I, I won't run laboriously through what those kind of benefits might be of a national digital twin, um, but I think they're very wide ranging uh, to society uh, around improving better outcomes for, for us, um, particularly through having higher performing infrastructure and the services it provides. Uh, I think massive benefits to the economy uh, in terms of national productivity uh, that derive from uh, using our infrastructure better. Um, I think huge benefits to business too. I can imagine that actually what we're doing here uh, is creating a whole new market, a whole new game, you could call it, um, for those who are um, buying digital twins, connecting digital twins, selling products and services in that market. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's going too far to say that, that this, this is almost like we're on the edge uh, of what our Victorian forebears did before us for physical. We, kinda, we can do the same again, but for digital. Um, and then benefits to the environment, uh, because I see that an awful lot of the major challenges that we face just now so thinking about net zero, resilience, circular economy, you know, those are 
quintessentially systemic challenges and they demand a systems-based solution. Uh, we can't solve them in silos and maybe up till now we've kind of operated our built environment in silos or, or you know, not seen it as a system. But I think that when we do recognize it as a system and have competent tools to be able to run it that way, like connected digital twins, uh, then we can drive those kind of kind of benefits, uh, which incidentally uh, are also benefits to people. So I think it's all about outcomes. It's all about people. That, that's uh, a key thing to say. And I think that the National Digital Twin Programme is a socio-technical change programme. This is not just about clever techie solutions. Uh, and, and I think we'll probably keep coming back to that theme as, as, we, as we run through. So what kicked it all off? Uh, was a fantastic report that came out of the National Infrastructure Commission three years ago. Um, and what that recommended was that we should move towards having this national digital twin, uh, that to enable it, we should put in place an information management framework. And I will describe that in, in quite a bit more detail in, in a bit. Uh, and then to enable that, we should bring people together from across government and academia and industry in what is really quite a big exercise to to, to come up with that information management framework to enable the national digital twin. So, so those were kind of high level important recommendations uh, in what I think was a really visionary uh, report. So the role of CDBB in that, this is the Centre for Digital Britain, uh, is firstly to deliver that information management framework. That, that's, our, that's our job. Uh, but it's not our job to deliver the national digital twin. It's not our job to build it, uh, it's our job to enable it. And what we see really is that the building of the National Digital Twin uh, is for everyone else. It's for all of us uh, to be developing digital twins and everything that goes with it, uh, the state of the art, uh, the, uh, the connections between them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, that's, that's for the industry to do, but the industry needs to be enabled. So our job is to deliver, it's the uh, industry's job to actually go and do the building, which is good news because that means a whole new market. And I think that when we're talking about changing the game, um, a large part of that is to do with how we uh, enable that market to be a vibrant market with low barriers to entry that enable all sorts of players to come and play and do their stuff uh, and innovate and do all sorts of wonderful things so that we end up with the, the best kind of national digital twin. So, in driving this, I guess it's important to have, um, have a vision uh, and, and understand where we're going. And, and I think I've, I've probably, I'm, I'm on the verge of laboring the point too much now, but this outcomes focus, I think is really important. You know, it does have to be all about um, driving improved outcomes for people and society. Uh, and a key part of that has to be the impact on the natural environment. So I think we're talking regeneration here. We're not just talking uh, about some kind of passive interface with the natural environment. So it's outcomes focused, uh, but also systems based. And I think a systems based view uh, is key to unlocking a lot of the value. Now, we, we put out a, um, a paper earlier this year called Flourishing Systems. Uh, I'd, I'd recommend it, Google it, have a look at, at what it says. Um, but, but the next few slides are really borrowing quite heavily from that uh, to, to illustrate really what we mean by that, but also why it matters, why it's important. So the first thing, I guess, is for us to see the built environment as a system of systems. Uh, it's the most amazing thing that we have built within which we live. We've built it for, for our own good. Uh, I think the built environment doesn't always act like it's for our own good. Uh, and I guess if all we do is just concrete over um, the, you know, the, the, the nearest park, then it doesn't feel like that. But, but you know, really important to see that, that this is something that we have built for, uh, for our benefit. Uh, and it, it, it needs to have that benefit at its heart. So I think that uh, the people should be the, the kind of the beginning and the end of all of this. But anyway, what, what, that, what that thing is that we've built, this system of systems, consists of economic infrastructure. So that's um, our um, transport networks, energy networks, water networks, um, waste treatment networks, telecoms networks, that's our economic infrastructure. 
and each of those are, are complex interconnected systems. Um, and then our social infrastructure, so our hospitals, prisons and schools, commercial industrial buildings, residential buildings, uh, all of which absolutely rely on the economic infrastructure uh, to make them work. <clears throat> so again, complex and interconnected. And then the natural environment, which itself is a complex interconnected system, uh, and our built environment interfaces with that. So when you add all of it up together, you get our built environment, <clears throat> this most amazing thing that we've built to live inside. Um, but we don't always see it that way. Uh, and if we don't see it that way, uh, then it's very difficult to manage it that way. And if we don't manage it that way, then we can't get the best out of it. So I think it's really important for us to see this as a system of systems. But maybe even more important than that is to see it as a system of services, because people live in this thing. Uh, and uh, as I say, it's all about people. Uh, and what people really do, I think, the, you know, the way they get the benefit uh, is from either direct or implied services from the, uh, the infrastructure. And that's how we get to the outcomes, the ones we desire, social, economic and environmental outcomes. Uh, and, and I think that this connection uh, between the kind of the rather mechanical system, which sounds like it's just about technical, uh, and the people is to do with the services. So if, if we are really focused on people and we make the connection between the kind of the hard concrete and steel of infrastructure and the soft squidginess of people, then it's the services that make that connection and deliver the outcomes. So a system of services too. And if we've got this systems-based view of the built environment, then it, it reveals some interesting things because uh, in the UK, we've got something like 99.5% of the infrastructure and built environment that we need already. And then each year we add 0.5% to it. Uh, and so we put quite a lot of, of thinking into the new stuff, that 0.5%. And that's important because that 0.5% is our construction industry, and the construction industry is worth something like 9% of our GDP. You know, so that is huge. That really does matter. It might on this diagram look like a small number, uh, but it really, really matters. But also the 99.5% really matters. So the argument here is that we should take a, um, a whole view, a holistic view of the whole thing, uh, and basically come up with solutions which are for the 100% not just for the 0.5, not just for the 99.5, but for the 100. Um, and if we're doing that, then I think we can see some really interesting uh, processes that can be improved throughout that life cycle. So for me, the most important processes are to do with the use. And this is me making my point again about the services, because the whole point of it is for people to use it. Uh, so that should be right at the centre of the processes that we improve. But in order to make the built environment and the infrastructure available for use, then what we have to do is operate and maintain it, obviously. And those processes, the operat operation and maintenance, generally happen at a system level, not at an asset level. Uh, and so we can see those processes basically carrying on forever. For as long as we want um, our built environment to work for us, we need to operate and maintain it. Uh, it doesn't have a life cycle, it goes on forever. But then every now and again, we need some new stuff. Um, and like I said, that's really important. Um, and so what we then do is kick off some planning and design and building, and then we integrate it back into the, into the system. So I think it's really important to see um, our projects uh, in, in terms of being interventions on the wider system. So instead of seeing our infrastructure as a series of construction projects, we can see it as a system and then our projects our interventions on the system. This is, this is the system thinking. And every single one of those processes on this diagram can be improved. They can be improved by making better decisions faster and cheaper. Uh, and how do you make better decisions faster and cheaper? Well, it's got something to do with managing information better. Uh, and that's kind of at the heart of what the National Digital Twin is about. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this, but basically what we're looking at uh, is, uh, is using information better to make better decisions, to drive better interventions uh, and lead to better outcomes in every single one of these processes. And if we're doing that, 
then that can drive us towards um, a sustainable system because it makes no sense for us to be living inside something that we say has to last forever or, or at least last as long as we want society to last. It makes no sense to, to have, have something that's got to last forever if it's not sustainable. You know, that doesn't compute. It has to be sustainable. So um, I think if we're, if we're really getting our heads around this system's thinking, uh, then we need to be driving towards sustainable system. Uh, and then I'd, I'd kind of reiterate the point that we need systems-based solutions for things like net zero and resilience and circular economy. And then eventually I get to the bit which is more close to digital twins, is seeing it as a cyber physical system. Now, I, I don't think that we can even begin to imagine a cyber physical system if we haven't got our heads around the system. So this system's thinking is an absolute must for us to unlock the value of industry 4.0 applied to our built environment. But, but doing that, I think, is, is not so complicated. Really, all it's saying is that digital assets have real value, just the same as physical assets do. And when we bring our digital world and our physical world together, then we unlock more value for ourselves, principally by taking data from the real world, doing something clever with it to drive better decisions and better interventions back in the physical world. But, but this is kind of what, this is our job. This is what we've got to do if we want to take over the digital worlds. We've got to, we've got to see them uh, and then we've got to, um, got to manage them. So how do we do that? I think a, a key part of it is seeing this information value chain. I've kind of touched on it already, but what this is is recognizing is that uh, you can get data from all sorts of different sources. That, those, those are the arrows at the bottom of the diagram, yeah, which could be from sensors uh, or it could be from the Twitter fire hose or it could be from satellite data or from wherever. It's just data. But generally that data isn't uh, of a, a great quality. Uh, and very often what we've got to do is some uh, some cleansing of it, maybe some structuring of it, et cetera, to make the data fit for use. So if we if we do all that lovely data management, which is hard work, incidentally, but if we do that, all we're left with is data that's fit, fit, fit for use. It's still just data. We have to do something with it to generate more value as we go up this uh, up this triangle. So we make sense of it. We analyze it. We apply uh, models to it and simulation, et cetera so that we generate insights. And those insights are of greater value than the data on which they were based. And then we can use those insights to drive better decisions. And if we drive better decisions, then we can have better interventions. And if we have better interventions, then we can drive better outcomes. So what this does is show us the connection between data and outcomes. And we said at the beginning, I hope we all agree, that outcomes are what it's all about. That's what matters. And now we have a connection between outcomes and data. But right in the middle, the thing that unlocks the value is making better decisions. And if we can make better decisions faster and cheaper, then we're driving better outcomes. So that, that's at the heart of it. Um, I apologize if it sounds a little bit just theoretical and esoteric, but I think it's good to be able to put our finger on the thing that actually matters. Um, and if we buy this, I hope, I hope that you're buying this, uh, then we can see the information value chain in digital twins. So in many ways, a digital twin is just an embodiment of that information value chain. So we're taking data from the real world. We're doing something clever with it to generate insights. We're using those insights to uh, drive decisions and the decisions drive the interventions back in the real world. Now, clearly this, this kind of diagram is, uh, is showing something physical. It's a, like a, a bit of rolling stock. Um, but we can also have digital twins of processes. So you can have digital twins of assets, processes, and systems. The, the same argument applies though. And also I'd say you don't have to have live data, a live data connection. Uh, what matters is that it's data at a refresh rate that is appropriate for the purpose to which it's put. And this is a point that we'd keep coming back to on digital twins that they really need to be driven by purpose. You know, what is the purpose of the digital twin? That will then determine pretty much everything else, including the data refresh rate. And then inside the digital twin, we can see that there's something really important about the data handling, uh, which can come from many different sources. 
um, there's something very important about the model, you know, the core code which is being used to generate the insights. Uh, and then I think there's something really important as well about visualization and helping humans to have a window into the digital twin so they can see what's going on uh, to help make the decisions. Uh, and then there's a whole question about where does the human fit in this loop? You know, it, it, it's, it's a, a human in the loop type question. Uh, is it just in making the decisions uh, or is it part of making interventions? So lots of kind of questions and variables uh, in what, what constitutes a digital twin. But I'm hoping that I've said enough here uh, to indicate what they're basically about. And if we can imagine a digital twin for one particular bit of our infrastructure, then we can also imagine digital twins for, for other bits. So now we've got a digital twin of the train, digital twin of the track, digital twin of the signaling. And doesn't it make sense to kind of connect them? Because there's gonna be some data from the track that's relevant to the train and vice versa. And so now we're starting to think of how we connect the digital twins and notice that what connects them is data. It's secure, resilient data sharing. That, you know, that's what connects twins. But if we can do that, then we have something that's even more valuable than just an individual digital twin, which incidentally is super valu valuable anyway. And we can take that outer layer and look at connected digital twins um, across transport sectors, so between road, rail and air, for example. Or we can zoom out again and make the same argument across whole sectors. So connections between road uh, and, and, sorry, between transport and energy and water. Now, I think that this is really interesting because if we take that systems view that I was espousing earlier on, then we can see that actually in the physical world, all of these sectors are connected. You know, energy is basically connected into all other sectors. And particularly as we move towards having electric vehicles and charging points all over the place, you can ask, is an electric vehicle part of the transport sector or part of the energy sector? Truth is, it's both because they're all connected. And therefore, this kind of secure, resilient data sharing becomes absolutely essential and, and key to having um, tools that can help us manage the systems. So that's, that's starting to describe an ecosystem of connected digital twins. And eventually, I've got to the point of saying what the national digital twin is. So it's not one massive model of everything. It's envisaged to be an ecosystem of connected digital twins. Uh, and we're not saying that it's going to be connecting every digital twin with every other digital twin. And we're not saying that everything that moves is going to have a digital twin. What we are saying is that it should be driven by purpose. So where it makes sense to have a digital twin because it can help drive the better decisions, then you should have one. And where it makes sense to connect digital twins, then you should make the connections. And so what we're, what we're talking about is this ecosystem which is driven by purpose and an ecosystem that would grow one purpose at a time. And so you can kind of see it growing almost organically one purpose at a time, which in many ways does mimic how the physical infrastructure grew. You know, nobody planned infrastructure in its entirety. What they did was just um, plan little bits of it and then add them together. And in many ways, that's how the National Digital Twin is envisaged to grow. Well, so that's all very nice, um, but it could be chaos, couldn't it? If, if every single one of these data connections um, was written in a bespoke way, which you can always do, you can always write an API and share data from, from one point to another, that's easy. But if every single one were different, what we would build is, is a network with massive friction in the system. So what we need really to make all of this work is a way of reducing that friction of data sharing and having some kind of standards that make it easier to, uh, to share data in consistent ways. Uh, and so if we now think about coordinating this slightly, connecting things together, but having an enough coordination to minimize the friction in data sharing, now we're talking about the National Digital Twin. Uh, and really that the heart of the National Digital Twin is enabling that secure, resilient data sharing. So when I first say National Digital Twin, it sounds like a huge, difficult thing to do, but it kind of resolves down to, can boil down to uh, somehow or other enabling this secure, resilient data sharing across organizational and sector boundaries. And what we think that's all about uh, is the quality and consistency of data. Now, if I take a cross section through this, which in some ways 
you can can see as a pipe. It's almost like a pipe. So let's take a cross section through it uh, and, and then see what that looks like. Uh, and, and don't be scared off by this next slide. I won't stay on it for very long, but it's just showing you what it is. So if we're taking a cross section through that pipe, what it looks like uh, is within the pipe, some clean data. And how do we make sure it's clean? Well, we need some rules. Uh, we need to um, have some protocols to make sure that only the right, uh, only authorized people can put the data in and take the right the, the data out. And so a lot of, of what is needed here are some standard protocols and some standards related to um, how we uh, um, uh, how we understand the data that is uh, is being put into it. Um, and I think that if we take another view, so, so I've, I've done the cross section uh, and I think that this, this view is maybe a little bit more accessible. So now I'm imagining almost like a plan view of it. Uh, what I think we are describing um, is a data infrastructure. We're enabling that pipe work to connect up uh, different digital twins uh, in, in different sectors, but also in different parts of the country. So this, this really is a data infrastructure. And we're very familiar with a physical infrastructure of transport networks, energy networks, water networks. But what, what we're kind of talking about now um, is a, a data infrastructure, which I would put to you um, is as big a game changer or potentially, if we can get it right, um, as big a game changer uh, as any one of those other physical networks and physical infrastructures uh, that I just ran through. And th this has to be outcome focused and systems based. Um, I think another thing that it has to be um, is good. So I already introduced the document that kicked, kicked all of this off, date called Data for the Public Good. And I think the clue is in the name there. Um, technology isn't always used for good. We know that. Um, and in some ways, technology itself is kind of amoral and it depends uh, on the values of the people who, who use it. Uh, so it, it's not a default that if we did all of this, it would automatically be, be good. And therefore, I think it's really important that we guide this journey with very clear values that we as an industry um, as, um, are, are very happy to sign up to, that shared values that make sure that this data is used for public good. And so one of the very first things we did in the National Digital Twin Programme uh, was uh, offer up these Gemini principles for, for conversation uh, to see if, if this kind of reflects what we want from our, our National Digital Twin. Uh, and it comes under the, the three headings of purpose, trust and function. So right at the centre of it is, is about the National Digital Twin must be trustworthy. If it's not trustworthy, then it won't work. And this is why it's not just a technical program, it's a socio-technical program. Uh, you know, it's absolutely essential that this thing that we build uh, is trustworthy. And I think that, that is to do with its openness and its security and its quality. So I won't run through what all of these principles are, but I think it might be interesting to come back to them in the conversation because you can kind of see some tensions in there. Because what we're saying is that it must be as open as possible, but also it must be secure. You say, oh, that, that sounds like a tension. And now we're, we're not saying where that balance point lies. We're just saying that they're both important. And the way we get to the right balance point is through conversation, uh, through dialogue uh, in the industry. Um, but, but I think that the point for me here that's most important is that this journey needs to be guided by values because there's no default that says that, that technical stuff works out well. We, we've got to put in effort to make it work out well. Okay, so now I'm on to the, 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 what are we, the what are we doing kind of stuff. Um, and I think in order to get that secure, resilient data sharing working, I've already suggested that it, it needs to have some standards related to the quality and consistency of data. Um, and we're calling those standards the digital commons. Uh, it's something that we need to share in common. They need to be open to all. Uh, this is the whole thing about the, the low barrier to entry. Um, uh, and they need, they need to be developed collaboratively. Uh, there needs to be consensus around that. Uh, but what those digital commons then do is create a huge digital twin market that I've already 
already touched on. And within that digital twin market, there will be people buying digital twins, people selling uh, products and services for digital twins. There'll be lawyers uh, helping with commercial arrangements. There'll be uh, insurers. There'll be everything that you'd expect in a, in a functioning market. And maybe that market needs a bit of regulation um, to, to correct any market failures. But basically what we're talking about here is creating a vibrant market which will then go and build the national digital twin. So I think that this is a game, um, you know, the game changer type of thing. Uh, and really what we're talking about is collaborating on the rules so that we can compete on the game. A game's no fun with no rules. Try to play football with no, no rules. It doesn't, it doesn't work. You know, some people are picking up the ball, some people are kicking it. it. It doesn't work. But if we agree on the rules, then we can play almost an infinite number of games based on, on the, the same rule. Um, and the delivery vehicle that we're using to, to do this, we've set up a digital twin hub. Uh, the digital twin hub uh, is really focused uh, on those players in the market. So the, the owner operators, um, and we see that, that very often the owner operators of physical assets will be the owners of digital twins. So these might be owner operators of, um, of infrastructure. Uh, they might be um, cities doing a similar thing in, in cities or local councils. So, so the owners of digital twins, uh, but also the suppliers of products and services. Also, we're starting to see an academic community uh, grow in the Digital Twin Hub uh, and interest from, uh, from lawyers and others who will have a part in the market that I talked about. So the Digital Twin Hub really is a, a means of concentrating that community of people who are, uh, are making waves uh, in Digital Twins. Uh, and what we've said about the Digital Twin Hub is it, is it should learn by doing and progress by sharing. If everyone had to go away and develop their own digital twins in their own way, learn all their own lessons, fall down all of their own holes, uh, then you can see it will take a long time. If we bring them together and share the lessons, then we can get to the destination quicker. So that's, that's what the Digital Twin Hub is, is about. It's, it's about practitioners learning by doing, progressing by sharing. And then we've got our digital commons where we have uh, some, uh, some specialists who are helping us to develop those common rules that um, will hopefully benefit the whole game, the collaborate on the rules, compete on the game thing. Um, and what we see there is that it's really important that those, um, those solutions that we're developing should be tested and validated by the practitioners. Um, it wouldn't work uh, if we were just to come up with some um, some semantic solutions and just kind of impose it on the market. The market wouldn't like that uh, and, and it wouldn't work. So I think if we're going to recognise this as a socio-technical change programme, how we go about it really matters. So we, we need somehow to, to um, enable that collaboration on the rules. But where that happens uh, is in digital commons. And then we've got the third part of our vehicle, which is about the change programme itself, uh, the social technical change programme. And this is because in the Digital Twin Hub, we see the innovators and the early adopters. And the Digital Twin Hub now has 777 members the last time I looked. So, so that's absolutely brilliant. And the DT Hub is a, is a vibrant, exciting community, but it's not everyone. Uh, and for us to unlock the full value of the national, national Digital Twin, it needs to spread far and wide. And so we need a means of engaging with um, a much broader community. That's the Socio-Technical Change Programme. And um, another point to make on this is that if we were to come up with a perfect technical, technical solution, uh, but it wasn't adopted, it would be completely useless. So the adoption is equally important as the, um, as the technical solution. Um, in the DT Hub, um, it's just about to go for a, a refresh on, on what it looks like and how you interact with it. So in some ways, what I've just shown there might be out of date in a, in a few moments, but um, it really is an exciting community and I'd, I'd commend it to any of you who are um, active in this area. Uh, join up, uh, join the networks which are, uh, are involved there. Um, and, and the best thing really is to get stuck in. So rather than kind of go just as a, as a consumer, 
Uh, there is some great stuff in there to consume, by the way, but it's even better uh, if you get stuck in and, and contribute because then it's much more like a community. And maybe that's an important thing for me to say is that the DT Hub essentially is a community. Um, the website is just an enabler of the community. Then in the digital commons, earlier this year, we uh, published this report, the pathway towards the information management framework. This was us suggesting what the way might, the way forward might be. Uh, and we've invited um, consultation on that. Um, we invited people to come back to us to engage and say if it works or if it doesn't work for them. Um, essentially what we're seeing is that there are, there are three key parts to the digital commons. The foundation data model, which is all about enabling um, a consistent approach to data modeling. Uh, the reference data library, which is all about enabling um, us to have shared reference data. And, and basically, if you don't have those two things, data sharing becomes really difficult. If everyone has got their own data models, which are completely incompatible, that increases friction. If everyone has their own version of reference data, that increases the friction. So, so addressing um, the foundation data model and the reference data library feel like essential things for us to do. And then the integration architecture is all about those protocols that I said earlier on the cross section of, of the pipe diagram. Um, and then very recently we've published um, these documents, the survey of top level ontologies and survey of reference data libraries. Um, now those are, are deeply technical documents uh, but I would still commend them to you because the team that has written them have written them in such uh, such a clever way. I can say this because I wasn't in the team, but they've done a really good job. That means that even though it's highly technical, it is accessible. And you can see the, kind of the direction of thought. Um, the pathway towards the information management framework, likewise, um, is a very accessible document. Uh, so I, I would commend it to you. Um, and then finally, on the, um, on the change program, uh, we've set up um, a number of different ways in which people can interface with the program. So one of the most important ones is that every Tuesday we have what we call a Gemini call, and that's inviting people in to see what we're up to. And it does change every week. There's, there's new stuff happening. So it is worth coming every week. But if you don't want to come every week, you can come once a month and you'll still get a window into what's happening. Because as I've explained before, we, we really need this to be open I and mean, people need to see inside to see what's what's going on. And we've set up as well what we call Gemini supporters and Gemini ambassadors, ambassadors for individuals, uh, supporters for organisations that want to come along and get involved in the journey and, and do something. Uh, so I'd commend all of that to you. And that that probably concludes what I was saying. Uh, what, what I'm really hoping is that you can tell from that that there is the potential here to change the game. I really think that this, this is a potential game changer. Uh, and the, the actuality of changing the game depends on us. You know, it's up to us. We can do it. Uh, and, I, and I really hope that we do. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Absolutely brilliant presentation. Um, we have got a few questions coming through. I think I'll... I'll, uh, as they continue to feed through, I'll just fire a few other thoughts at you. Um, I think you've ticked an awful lot of these things off the list because you've already described the value of the digital twin to businesses in the sector. Um, I'd mentioned earlier and, and was thinking about the idea that obviously there's other nations involved in trying to capture data and work with data. And I was on a call yesterday with some... Um, design team colleagues in the US and in Canada. And it would it seems like they could really use something like the Gemini principles, because if you look at Toronto, for example, and the Google Sidewalk Labs project, that hit challenge and barrier after barrier due to uh, a lack of transparency and clarity around the way data was used around its ethical use. Um, and so my first question to you is, <clears throat> What, give, give us a bit more insight into the sort of ethics and privacy and how that might be seen. And the second question is more, much more on the sort of public level about, I know that we've got shared views on this, but we have to engage the public in, in the development and the use of this. So is, has there been any thought as to how the public will, will engage with digital twins and, and, and learn to love them as opposed to learn to, learn to fear them, I suppose? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a fantastic area, isn't it? I, mean, I, th I think we could probably use up a whole 
a whole hour just uh, chatting around this because I, I think you've touched on a lot of of really important areas there. I, mean, I think fundamentally for me, uh, it's important that uh, the national digital twin should be trusted. I kind of touched on that at, at the heart of the uh, the Gemini principles, uh, because if it isn't, even even if it's there to do people good, if they don't trust it, uh, they will they will come and tear it down. And, and I would say rightly so, you know, because it, it must be trusted and therefore we have to put the effort in to helping people to trust it. And I think a lot of, a lot of that uh, is to do with the, the openness and the security and the quality. Uh, um, and um, you, you, there, there's a lot written, isn't there, about the trade-offs that people have to have when they kind of sign away all their data yeah. in order to get benefits. And I'm not convinced about that. I'm not convinced that they, there even needs to be a trade-off. I think that this can be um, just really driven on benefits and outcomes. Uh, and, and part of that is making a clear distinction between systems data and personal data. So an, an awful lot, almost most of what I was talking about and the benefits that we were, we were talking about getting from the National Digital Twin uh, is working with systems data. It's data about our assets and processes and systems in the built environment. It's got nothing to do with personal data. I think your, your description of the system of systems was was really interesting. And and actually what really grabbed me was the, the idea that service to the community was at the heart of that. I mean, is, is the National Digital Twin something that you can see being of service to the, to the wider community? And by that, I mean that we are, will freely give away as much data as we possibly could ever fancy on our mobile phones because they offer such high levels of convenience and we almost give away that trust um, because we're receiving such conveniences from the service. So is, 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 can you imagine a future where the digital twin is being used by, by the everyday public? Very much so. Yeah, I'd really hope so. And on that, um, that diagram that I showed uh, about the processes across the built environment, and I, and I kind of put use at the centre of it. Uh, and I think it's quite notable that, that within the industry, when you look at um, the kind of delivery processes, um, they, they more often than not start with planning and kind of end with commissioning. And, and there's, there's very little in there about the actual use. Uh, but I think that uh, if we're taking this um, outcomes focused systems based view, then what we see is that it's all about use. You know, people are the beginning and the end of the process. It's, it's satisfying their needs um, that, that kind of drives it in the first place. So yes, I think that there are all sorts of ways in which the use of the built environment can be uh, improved uh, by the National Digital Twin. So, so it's a long way around saying yes. And, and, and yeah, again, just to jump on something you mentioned there around the outcomes focused, you know, it would appear that uh, there's a lot of government agendas at the moment moving in the direction of, of value-based decision-making. You know, we spoke in the past about the Digital Twin program aligning with the value toolkit um, that's forthcoming in the, in the construction sector. And again, fantastically ambitious, great ethos that all decisions will be value-focused value, value focused and value-based. Um, but my hope potentially for the Digital Twin is that it will make that value-based decision-making um, the process of that more accountable in the in the construction sector. We're almost uh, engaging in a, in, as you say, in a whole new game, whereby the, there'll be a system out there, a digital infrastructure that will check whether we're doing what we say we are doing as as architects, designers, construction companies, because the data will be so accessible, it will be open. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, I I agree, and I, and I think that you know there is a, a kind of a high level view of value that, that can define it in, in terms of outcomes per pound. You know, that, that's what we're really after. And those outcomes being economic, social, environmental outcomes. And we're wanting to maximize, maximize that. But um, I think that you're right to kind of point back into those decisions. Because I, I think that's kind of where we unlock the value. You know, in many ways, information is like the carrier of value. And if, you know, we, we need to have that information in an unbroken golden thread all the way through our processes. And if, if it's broken, we lose value. So information is like the carrier of value. 
but where it gets released, the point of release is at making a better decision. So that sounds also theoretical. Where, where it kind of matters is that we do actually make better decisions <laughs> because it would be imaginable that we put all of this stuff in place, we serve up much better information to enable people to make better decisions, but they ignore it and they make decisions the same way they always did. Uh, in which case it's kind of useless. Um, but, but part of that then means, uh, kind of comes around to exactly what you said, that people need to kind of be accountable for the decisions yeah. they make. And if they're making decisions and not using the information, then, then that sounds like something somebody should be asked about. Absolutely. And it, I mean, so globally, there's not, um, I can only think of New Zealand who are really pushing government policy in a direct a direction of, of value-based decision-making. Um, this would appear like an absolute game changer, um, forgive, forgive the pun on game changers life, but an absolute game changer with regards to, there, there's no other government that I'm aware of that is attempting to put value and value-based decision-making that isn't a traditional view of value, it's not about cost reduction, it's about real value to the environment, to society, at the heart of, um, well, one of its key sectors, its keystone sectors of the country in construction, but also at the heart of all decision-making and processes of accountability, you know, going forward with regards to its digital infrastructure and its construction sector. I think, it, you know, it's wildly ambitious. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. all credit. Yeah. I, I, I agree, but it's not just coming from one direction, is it? Which is, is really good because I, I think that you know, you've you've picked this up from the stuff that we're trying to do on the, the National Digital Twin Program, but kind of like you you indicate that there's other angles, and so for example, the work of Project Thirteen you know, has has for for quite a few years now been banging that value drum, and then also the work of CIH with the Value Toolkit. Um, you know, what has recently come out with the, um, uh, the National Infrastructure Strategy, what I anticipate might come out with the construction playbook. You know, there's an awful lot that is, is kind of pointing in the same direction. So we, it feels like we're kind of edging, edging in that direction. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, for me, it's, it's one of the most globally, it's one of the most cohesive responses to uh, increasing social pressures, the increasing environmental climate emergency and then in, in, in our country, in the UK, you know, uh, disasters and tragedies like, like the Grenfell Tower fire and the focus on building safety, all of these things seem to have coalesced um, to put us at a really exciting uh, position, really an opportunity where we, our response, I think today, it is, you know, should be really given credit because we've responded incredibly quickly and incredibly well to how we start to manage data, how we start to ensure continuous improvement and for me you can only really build continuous improvement if you're going to baseline and benchmark in some way um and and, and that's the value of, of of exactly what you're describing i i think i think you're exactly right and i kind of i, I kind of want to bottle what you're saying because i think i think you, you know you're saying it in in really good words you know, maybe what we need is to have have you in the national digital twin program doing doing the presentations actually um, <laughs> but um I'm gonna, I've got some, Mark, I've got some, sorry, I'll let you finish your point there. But yeah, I was just going to say that, that all of this is genuinely exciting, like you say, um, but there's, there's a but. <laughs> and the but is that underneath it, we've got to do some really hard housework, because at the moment, we've got to be honest with ourselves, our, our data isn't in a fit state to do all of this lovely stuff. Uh, and it does mean that at that ground level, we've got to do some serious hard work to, to get it into a shape that where we can do all of this stuff. You know, the promise is massive and it feels like it's actually doable, but but there's still some real hard work to do to get there. And yeah, you know, we should we shouldn't underestimate the grunt that is needed. Yeah, and there's a big education piece, like you say, that sort of runs across that. Um, I'll dive into some questions now because we've got some, quite a few interesting questions coming through. Uh, we don't have to, there's quite a few of them, so we don't have to dwell um, in, in, in particular length on them, but obviously give them give them the time that you feel is needed. I think very quickly, we've got a, a bit of a conversation going on in the questions uh, panel around, is this not just BIM Plus? And um, should we not just call it something simpler rather than calling it a national digital twin? Should we just call it BIM Plus? Oh, good, good question. So um, 
I think it absolutely does follow on from the brilliant work that we've already done in BIM. I, I think BIM is kind of an essential foundation for all of this thinking. We couldn't even imagine what we're talking about now if we hadn't done the foundational work in BIM, because what that has established is the importance of information management and, and the industry kind of, it wasn't there even a few years ago. So, so BIM is utterly essential and I, I kind of see it as a continuum. So we're not talking about something something different and we're definitely not saying, oh, you know, now there's uh, something new and shiny in town, forget about BIM. It's totally not that. This, this is building. Um, I think when it when it comes to the name, you know, a, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. It doesn't matter what you call it. You could call it Bob if you want to. It's still the same thing. Uh, and what we're talking about on on the, you know the information management, sorry, the in, information value chain kind of being wrapped around digital twins, the idea of connecting digital twins, secure, resilient data sharing, that is a build. You know, it, it, it's that's not the same. It's a build on an essential foundation, but it's something more. Yeah. So I, I think um, in many ways, call it what you will, it's still the same thing and it's still valuable. I suppose in, in the past, I've, I think, you know, I've, I've very publicly questioned the sort of BIM mandates and, and the way that's gone through. Um, just with a view that we, if we, if, if we try to raise the bar, sometimes that bar is seen not as, um, as uh, a mandate, it's seen as an aspiration. Uh, when a bar is put in that place. But I think that's more about culture and behaviour in our industry. Um, and actually what the BIM mandate has really done is is, is teach us the basics. Um, the, as you say, the foundation of this. Um, I think there's an opportunity with, with the progression into the discussion around <coughs> the National Digital Twin to really start um, showing some exemplars around innovation and, and, and how, it's, how it's being used uh, within the industry. I'll dive onto another question. Um, We've got David Elliott, who has, has put forward a question around uh, how applicable is this to sort of a retrofit and improvement? Um, obviously, a lot of that building stock already exists. I mean, in some cases, I would imagine that data infrastructure actually already exists in, in thousands of places around the country. Exactly. That's precisely it. I think, I think you pretty much answered the question there. So, yes, it's totally applicable to retrofit, um, partly because of the amount of data that already exists. Um, but also um, because the cost of capture of new data is, is dropping through the floor, uh, you know, whether that's from sensors uh, in existing buildings uh, or even kind of capturing uh, geometric data of existing buildings. You, you, it, it, it's something that is becoming very accessible now. So, so it's a good question. Um, but you know, the, the answer is it's utterly applicable to retrofit. And I, th I think to pick up on your point there on the cost reductions, it's, it, we're absolutely seeing that. I mean, I think I, there was a statistic of the other day that in 2018, the global sensor market was around 150 billion. And by 2024, it's expected to be around 354 billion. So we're, you know, we're looking at a, a incredible exponential growth and acceleration in the ability to capture data. Um, let's just dive on to another question here. Nick, um, Nick Dutton has uh, spoke very uh, concisely in the questions around digital twins sort of already existing in other areas and in other industries, so, you know, so engineering design and uh, or computer modeling in, in other areas such as healthcare. Um, I, are we just reinventing this for construction or is it is, is, is what you're proposing here bigger than that? Um, so, yeah, Nick is exactly right digital twins are, are not new to humanity they feel like they're new to the built environment but but uh, really what we're doing is just applying existing thinking so it's not reinventing it uh, you know it's, it's not inventing something for ourselves that we don't want to listen to from someone else it, it's it's actually porting across all those lessons uh, and so uh, we see some of the uh, most advanced thinking in digital twins uh, in an, in advanced manufacturing uh, and one of the best examples, uh, interestingly, and I think it's a very accessible example, uh, is in Formula One, um, which you know, it would be nice to talk through how the Formula One digital twins get, get used. Um, but it's really interesting to me that you can kind of talk that through and then think, oh, yeah, this, this can apply to trains, can't it? You know, if it applies to a Formula One car, it can apply to a train, can't it? And, and actually, a lot of the lessons are directly applicable 
in our sector. So, um, so Nick is, is right to raise that, uh, but like I say, it's not reinvention, it's more application. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, David Elliott, is this presentation going to be shared? Absolutely, David. Uh, it's streaming live now on YouTube, so we'll, we'll be able to get recordings following that. Um, Seema has asked, are there possible applications to this in terms of waste management across cities? And I suppose I would add on to that is, is there another trick to be had there around trying to reinforce the circular economy through looking at waste management and digital infrastructure in cities? Yeah, to totally so. <laughs> um, in fact, I was looking at um, uh, some slides that had come from the uh, Dame Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, on exactly this just yesterday. Uh, so, so yes, um, I think that uh, waste is really interesting in, in economic infrastructure because in some ways it, it feels like it's the poor relation at the moment, you know, when you compare it against transport, energy, water, you know. But um, uh, I think it's kind of just the beginning because at the moment it looks very linear, doesn't it? We kind of collect stuff that we call waste and then we take it away and we, we put it in a, in a hole somewhere. Um, whereas actually, as soon as we start seeing that waste as a resource and we start to see multiple life cycles of resources, uh, then, then this whole idea of digital twins and being able to, to, to track things, uh, make better decisions, uh, I think becomes completely applicable. So yes, it's totally applicable to, to waste. I think there's a, there's a long journey to go on that and it can help to facilitate the circular economy because um, I, would, I would also kind of indicate how that circular economy thinking uh, is a systemic issue because you can have resources popping up and being used in, in one sector and then being reused or applied in a different way uh, in another sector because the resource can have multiple life cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think managing resources through multiple life cycles is exactly the kind of thing that a digital twin can help with. Um, and so I would kind of look forward to seeing digital twins being used more and more and in ways which are more exciting in the waste sector. At the moment, it's probably a bit limited. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think we're already, as an example, we're already starting to see um, the cost of waste resources rise through uh, some really innovative material startups who are using waste glass and waste plastic in construction. Um, and, and we're seeing the price per tonne of waste glass and waste plastic already accelerate. So I think what you said there is absolutely spot on. Um, the really interesting question from Craig around uh, how, we, how, uh, how are you engaging local authorities and how have they responded to the idea of the national digital twin i suppose because many of many of us will see local authorities as either the barriers or the enablers to to engaging with a lot of this yeah so so we've got um, a number of local authorities as members of the dt hub already um i mentioned that that our perception is that at the moment the dt hub is is populated by innovators and early adopters so, so what i'm guessing is that what we're seeing in the DT Hub from the point of view of local authorities um, are the ones that are, are kind of most forward thinking. Uh, but it's really good to have the local authorities there. They're getting involved. You know, I said earlier on, it's really, it's really good to have people in the DT Hub who are getting stuck in. That's, that is our experience with the local authorities that we've got at the moment. Um, and what I hope that that means is that it, it actually creates some uh, some momentum and some reason why other local authorities might want to join is because there's there's something of value that is relevant to them. So so yes, that they, they they are involved and it's it's feeling pretty relevant in a, a local authority context. Absolutely. Well, Mark, we're, we're we're coming towards the end, or we've come towards the end of our of our session together. I must I must say thank you very much. It was incredibly inspiring and very enlightening as well. Um, uh, we've had some great um, comments and interaction from the audience. If anybody else wants to continue this conversation um, around some of these points, uh, you know, feel free to connect with myself or Mark um, on LinkedIn. Uh, it's probably the best place to start. And thank you all for attending. Um, thanks again, Mark. And Appreciate hopefully it. everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Yeah, and thanks. You're, you're a great host. Cheers, Mark. Okay, thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of Game Changers Live.